Hi, welcome to History in the Kitchen this week. Today we're going to be taking a look at uh, George Washington and some myths that surround him, as well as one of the enslaved workers at Mount Vernon, Hercules, and we're going to be making Martha Washington's jumbles. I'm very excited about the jumbles. They taste really good. Um, I did some test kitchening yesterday and um, I they came out flat. So today they're gonna come out great. Uh, historical recipes are sometimes hard to transcribe. Um, but today they're gonna to be a lot better. So uh, if you are not busy later and you feel like checking out my blog, you can check it out at www.teachinghistoryherway.com. You can also follow my page or you can follow my YouTube channel if you wanna go back to the recipe or if you wanna see a previous episode. I also post some teachery things up there. Uh, you can follow me at Teaching History Her Way on YouTube. Uh, or you can also follow me on Twitter, Teaching History Her Way. The, um, actually Twitter is History Her Way because it doesn't give me enough characters. So today we're gonna go in a little bit of a different order than we have been in the past. We're gonna start cooking a little bit first. So the first thing that you're gonna to need to do is you're gonna to need to preheat your oven to 400, and then we are gonna make some of the, we're gonna make the dough first, and we're gonna throw it into the freezer for five minutes to make sure that it's cold so that our, our jumbles don't come out a flat, greasy mess. Jumbles are sort of a sugar cookie, but they're more like a biscuit. So they're going to be crunchy and they're really, really delicious. If you have nutmeg on hand and you plan on using nutmeg, that's great. I used nutmeg yesterday and in previous trials. The nutmeg tastes really good, but you can also use cinnamon or if you're feeling a little brave, you can use pumpkin pie spice. All right, so I'm gonna preset, uh, preheat my oven. I'm gonna grab my butter and then we'll go over all the other ingredients that you need. You're preheating to 400. And my butter is pre-sliced and it is cold. Don't use room temperature butter. We wanna keep the dough as cold as we possibly can. All right, so Martha Washington's jumbles were a uh, Martha recipe, but Martha Washington herself would never have cooked them. The Washingtons had enslaved chefs that would do the cooking for them, one of whom was Hercules. Hercules was born in 1754, and he got to, the records say that he got to Mount Vernon at around 1771. All right, so in the kitchen, he would have needed the following ingredients. He would need one and a quarter cups of flour. We're gonna increase the cups of flour that, we've, that were on the previous recipe. We want these cookies to be a little bit drier. So we're gonna put one and a quarter cups of flour into our bowl and we'll start mixing very soon. If you are using a wooden spoon, totally fine. You can do this by hand. If you're using an electric mix mixer, your paddle is the better, um, is the better tool to use. All right, there we go, so that you can see the paddle. All right, so we have one and a quarter cups of flour in here. Next ingredient we're gonna put in is our half a cup of butter. Half a cup of butter is one stick. So let's see if we can get that in there. Grab that. And at this point, that's when we're gonna turn our paddle on. All right. Next ingredient that we need is sugar. It's three quarters of a cup of sugar. Cookies are a little bit finicky when you cook them. Uh, they have to be the proper temperature. If you put a little bit too much flour in, they're gonna be too dry and they're gonna crack. If you put in too much sugar, they're gonna get this, or, uh, or melted butter, they're gonna get this lacy um, feel to them. You don't wanna do that. So make sure when you measure your butter, you actually have three quarters of a cup. And I realize that I'm still using a wet measure. I don't have a dry measuring cup that's three quarters of a cup. So I'm gonna work on getting that for next week. All right, so we'll put our sugar in. All right. You need one egg. There we go. I'm gonna put it in my garbage bowl that I talked about last week. And nutmeg. I have found that the amount of nutmeg that I put in, uh, one teaspoon is plenty. Half a teaspoon wasn't enough, one teaspoon was plenty. It made the cookie just the right amount of spicy sweet. And we will get that going. All right. So while that mix 
Atlantis, let me tell you a little bit about Hercules besides when he was born. Um, Hercules wasn't always owned by the Washingtons. Hercules was actually acquired by George Washington, and it feels really funny to use that language about a human being. It's kind of gross. But he was acquired by George Washington by, from someone who owed Washington money. Uh, Washington loaned money to a man named John Posey. John Posey owed Washington money, and in order to pay him back, he gave uh, Washington Hercules. Hercules would have grown up on a plantation. Hercules is wife was named Alice and they had three children together and he was one of the enslaved people that George Washington brought to Philadelphia when he was uh, when he became president so when Washington becomes president he doesn't go to Washington DC Washington DC is not a thing yet he'll first go to New York and I'll show you a picture of the president's mansion in New York and then he'll move to Philadelphia now, when he moves to Philadelphia, he calls upon Hercules to come with him to be his chef. Hercules was this incredibly celebrated chef. He was brilliant. If you read documents from the time, you'll read about how good the food was because Hercules was that good of a chef. One of the things that Hercules uh, was allowed to do by George Washington was sell any extra food from the kitchen, anything that wasn't eaten. And um, according to one of the Washington grandchildren, that equivocated to about $200 a year, which was about a chef's salary. So Hercules was able to buy things, and Hercules was really, really well-dressed. It looks like my dough is pretty much done. Hercules was really well-dressed, and Hercules was pretty much allowed to move about Philadelphia freely. Except, we have to remember, Hercules was not free. Hercules could move about freely, but he always had to return. He always had to be ready to cook. He was at the president's beck and call. Now, when, um, when Hercules went to, Phil went to Philadelphia with Washington, there was a law in Philadelphia that was a gradual prohibition law, and it prohibited non-residents, so people who were visiting Philadelphia, from holding slaves there for more than six months. So if you brought an enslaved person with you to Philadelphia and they were there for more than six months, that enslaved person was automatically free. George Washington didn't really like that law. A lot of his money was tied up in enslaved people and he didn't want to lose the people that he brought to Philadelphia because losing people meant losing money to Washington. So George Washington had to come up with a workaround. He wanted to go through the law, but his lawyer told him to pretty much avoid trying to circumvent the Philadelphia law, or not circumvent, try to get exempted from the Philadelphia law because he was a federal official. Basically what Washington said was, I'm president of the United States, so I have to be in Philadelphia, so I don't have to follow that law where my enslaved people after six months are free. And his lawyer, Edmund Randolph, was like, no, 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 don't do that. Don't try to go around the state government of Philadelphia. Instead, put your enslaved people on a rotation. So every six months, different people would come in and out of Philadelphia and others would go back to Mount Vernon only to return to Philadelphia shortly after in order to avoid being, uh, avoid that required manumission after, after six months. So Washington made this workaround for this law and Hercules didn't, didn't love it. And neither did any of the people that came with him because it wasn't fair. All the other people that came to Philadelphia and they were there for more than six months were free. Why weren't they? So eventually Hercules goes back to Mount Vernon and he escapes from Mount Vernon. No matter how good Hercules good, Hercules had it. No matter how wonderful his clothes were or how often he was allowed to, to go about his business in Philadelphia, he did not want to be enslaved. People don't want to be enslaved. So Hercules um, self-emancipated. And records show that he ended up going to Philadelphia. Or not, so, not Philadelphia, excuse me. The original record said he went there, but he ended up living in New York, living the rest of his life out in New York City. We don't know what he did. We don't know what his life was like when he was in New York City, but we do know that that's where he ended up according to, according to records. All right, so let's do something with this dough and then we'll talk a little bit more history. So you're gonna take your dough out and we are going to make sure that this dough gets chilled a little bit. We're gonna put it in the freezer. If we put it in the refrigerator, it's gonna take too long 
And I could go on about history all day long for days and days and days, ask any of my students. Oftentimes I will miss the bell. But um, you are not, I'm sure I am not the only thing that you are doing today. So, hmm, that's a little stuck. There we go. So we're gonna take the dough, pour it out. I'm doing my best to avoid touching it, not because my hands are dirty, because of course I washed my hands before we started, but because I don't want my fingers to warm the dough at all. Um, like I said, yesterday when I made, made this with warm dough, the cookies were a disaster. They tasted really good. Today's cookies are gonna be really great. So I'm gonna put these in the freezer and then I'll return to talk history with you. And you should go put yours in the freezer too. We're gonna do this for five minutes just to make sure that the dough is chilly. Also set my timer for five minutes so that I can tell you when to go get it and so that I don't forget because I've been talking. All right, so back to Hercules and back to Hercules' self-emancipation. Washington is known as the founder who set his enslaved people free at the end of his life. That's true, but it's only sort of true. So Hercules is a self-emancipated slave and technically, for a while, he could have been brought back to Washington under fugitive slave laws because he was, in fact, a fugitive. It sounds silly, but he stole himself. That's what it was considered. Uh, when a person ran, it was considered that they stole themselves. However, um, Washington's will in 1799 stated that anybody who was enslaved to him was to be freed upon the death of Martha, upon the death of his wife. Well, Martha wasn't 100% comfortable with that because Martha also had, uh, had people that she owned in her name. Those people were called dower slaves. And those people weren't freed by Washington because they technically weren't Washington's property. So on Mount Vernon, you have a group of people who, is, who are to be freed upon Martha's death. And then you have a group of people who are not to be freed at all because Washington has no control over that. Well, Martha Washington ends up setting the enslaved people who were owned by Washington free as soon as she can. And um, I don't mean to sound like she gave them their freedom because freedom is a right to which they are entitled. However, legally, they were no longer bound to her or bound to Mount Vernon. And according to Abigail Adams, in a letter that she wrote, Martha was petrified that, they would, that the people would kill her in order to, in order to hasten her death. And um, the freedom means that much. So, um, and then the enslaved people who belonged to Martha, they were never, um, they, were, they never saw freedom at all, unless they took it for themselves. Upon Martha's death, the people that she owned were split amongst her grandchildren. And that included Hercules' children as well. Because Hercules' wife, Alice, was technically Martha Washington's property. The children were Martha Washington's property and they were never freed. So Hercules became a free man, but that was at the expense of leaving his family behind forever and never seeing them again. So when we remember the Washingtons, just in the same way we remember the Jeffersons, um, we also need to remember the people who lived at Mount Vernon and the people who helped, his, who helped their lives function, who made their lives function. Um, all right. So, so, speaking of Washington and Washington's myths, you may have seen I posted a picture of these earlier. These are some beautiful teeth. This picture is courtesy of mountvernon.org. These are a, this is a picture of George Washington's dentures. One of my favorite stories about George Washington is about his teeth because everybody goes on and on about his wooden dentures. George Washington did not have wooden teeth. He did have really bad gum disease though. And over the course of his life, his teeth fell out. And one of the reasons why he never really smiled is because his mouth was always in pain. First, because of the tooth pain, but then second, because would you want to wear these in your mouth? There are springs inside. They are really uncomfortable. And if you look at pictures of Washington, portraits of Washington, excuse me, you'll see the progression of his teeth falling out and when, when, and, when and when not he is wearing his dentures because his mouth 
sinks in as he gets older. These teeth are not wood. These teeth are made of ivory. They are made of animal bone. I heard that there's a there are pieces of hippo teeth in there somewhere. And they're also made from human teeth. There are human teeth in these dentures. So uh, next time you hear somebody say that Washington had wooden teeth, you can say, no, that's not true. He had these awful, ugly dentures that were made of all different kinds of things. In addition, Washington wore his last tooth, the last one that fell out of his mouth, as a necklace. So uh, interesting stuff about George Washington's teeth, which I thought might be a good way to open. All right. We've got 25 seconds left on that dough. Let's go grab it. And then we're going to talk about whether or not George Washington was a Republican. All right, I've got my dough. Hopefully you've got your dough too. Because our next step is rolling it out. And we are going to cut it in circles you could use a cookie scoop if you want to, that's fine, but you're just gonna get lumpy cookies because there's no baking soda or salt in here um, to make the cookies rise or do anything interesting. That's why I said that they're more like a biscuit. Um, or if you don't have a round cookie cutter, I realize I didn't tell you to get one, just get a glass. After you roll it out, you can use a glass to make them round. All right, so George Washington, was he a Republican? Well, George Washington was in charge of a republic, but George Washington himself was not a Republican. In fact, George Washington advised against political parties at all. And basically he was talking to Alexander Hamilton and Thomas Jefferson at this point um, about the Federalists and the Democratic Republicans because he could see the writing on the wall. He could see that um, the country was dividing. And in fact, in his farewell address, he warned against political parties. So George Washington was not a Republican. He wasn't in anything. Um, George Washington's farewell address says, however, political parties may now and then answer popular ends. They are likely in the course of time and things to become potent engines by which cunning, ambitious, and unprincipled men will enable to subvert the power of the people and to usurp for themselves the reins of government, destroying afterwards the very engines which have lifted them to unjust dominion. So he worried that political squabbles, political party squabbles, were going to ruin things, were going to stymie install the government. You can take with that, or take from that what you will, about today's current society. All right, next. George Washington grew hemp at Mount Vernon. What do you think, true or false? George Washington grew hemp at Mount Vernon. George Washington totally grew hemp at Mount Vernon. That is, uh, that is true. He did indeed grow hemp, but not that kind of hemp. Uh, George Washington grew hemp for industrial use. So basically hemp fibers were used for rope. That's a really fun one to talk to my students about because they're always like, hey, did George Washington grow hemp? Why, yes, he did, but not for the reason you think he did. All right, George Washington and Martha had several children together. They did not. George Washington and Martha had zero children together. There were children from Martha's previous marriage, but uh, no Washington Martha children uh, of their own. All right, got another one for you, true or false? Washington was a great military leader. Some of you are gonna get really mad at me for this one. Washington was a great military leader. You're rolling out this dough nice and thin, by the way, while I'm talking. Hopefully I don't talk too much, make the dough warm, and then have mush for cookies. George Washington was a eh, military leader. How about that? Um, first in war, first in peace does not mean best in war, best in peace, in the words of Alexis Co. Um, Washington basically caused a world war at one point. So... When Washington was 22 and he was fighting for the British, so remember the colonies were British at one point and Washington was a part of the British colonies, thus he fought in the British army. Um, he was sent uh, to investigate whether the French were building forts on land that were claimed, on land that was claimed by the British. So when the Native American people who were guiding him around told him that there were only like 50 French soldiers nearby. Washington decided that he was going to make the first move and he was going to shoot first. And one of the people that Washington, um, not Washington himself perhaps, but that ended up dead in this whole skirmish was a, um, was a French diplomat. 
And then after that, the French and the British were formally engaged in war. So George Washington made a call and it turned out to be a pretty bad one because once, <laughs> once that diplomat died, uh, France and Britain were going to be at war for a while. Um, in the American Revolution, Washington lost more battles than he won, but George Washington had some really good things going for him. George Washington uh, was in charge of aspiring, so he knew that he needed to use espionage in order to win. So he had some, that strategy going for him. He knew the power of propaganda. He would find out stories of atrocities done by British soldiers and publish them everywhere to uh, bring morale over to the American side. And also, he was really persistent. He just didn't give up. So while we had one military general uh, for the entire American Revolution, the British changed every once in a while and we had Washington through the whole thing. So he stuck with it. That's pretty good, I would say. All right, let's talk a bit about Washington's hair. Washington did not do his own hair and Washington also did not wear a wig. Washington had his hair powdered by enslaved people at Mount Vernon. He had long hair that he would keep in a ponytail and that white was from powder. He did go gray, but originally George Washington was a redhead. Take that. All right. I wrote down the myths that I wanted to cover so that I wouldn't forget any. George Washington demonstrated honesty by cutting down a cherry tree. False. It's funny that our national myth about honesty is actually a lie. Uh, he did not chop down a cherry tree and then admit it to his father. That was actually put in a book by a Mr. Weems to help teach morality, and Mr. Weems made it up. So the story goes that George Washington was given a hatchet by his father, and out of excitement, he went outside and he chopped down his father's cherry tree. And when his father, when asked by his father, who son chopped down my cherry tree, George Washington responded, tis I who cut down your cherry tree. And the father apparently said that, um, apparently said that his honesty was worth like a thousand cherry trees. So that is a myth. All right, so you should be cutting by now. This is going, this dough, according to the recipe, because it's cut down so much, originally recipes in the 1700s were done by the pound because they were making so much, um, so, so much for so many people. So this recipe, according to the translation, should make six of these cookies. Now, some people like to make them in circles that are hollow. Others make them into like a pretzel knot. Um, I'm not doing that because I want to avoid touching this dough as much as I possibly can. Um, I also might need some flour too. So, um, I'm gonna actually sprinkle a little bit of flour on either side of these uh, just to make them a little bit drier. So these are, again, Martha Washington's jumbles. They are a delicious cookie. Apparently they're also called the first cookie. Who knows? All right. Martha Washington's cookies obviously weren't the first cookies, but jumbles apparently were the first cookie. And if you want to give that like a little smell too, smells nice, smells like, smells like nutmeg and sugar. And these are super, super yummy cookies. All right, so I'm done for now with that. I am going to dust them with a smidge of flour, mostly because I want to make sure they stay together. Now, what happens if History in the Kitchen has a cookie fail today? Well, one thing that we will learn is that everybody makes mistakes. And the second thing that we will learn is that I'm going to be like Washington and I'm going to cook again next week anyway. So hopefully we don't have a cookie fail today. All right, so my cookies are looking good. They're looking nice and round flour on there and I'm going to put them on my cookie sheet. The cookie sheet also matters. Your cookie sheet should be cold or room temperature. When you cook, a, when you bake a cookie, don't ever bake your cookie on a warm cookie sheet. Okay. And I'm going to put these in the oven. These go in the oven for 10 minutes. So we're going to have some, a 10 minute more history chat while these cook. Awesome. Okay, so 
I promised you that I would show you that picture of the original house that the president lived on. And this is on Cherry Street. Maybe that's why Weems chose a cherry tree. Hopefully you can see that. There it is. That's the pre first presidential mansion. Uh, George Washington was not the first president to live in the White House. Uh, while the decision to move the capital of the United States from Philadelphia to the Potomac River to what is now Washington, D.C., was made during Washington's administration between basically uh, Hamilton and Jefferson, but Hamilton in the South in order for the states to assume the debt of, or excuse me, in order for the federal government uh, to assume state debt in order for those um, representatives from the South to agree to that. You might have heard that in Hamilton, cabinet battle number one. Um, the only way that that could happen is, according to Southerners, one of the ways, only ways that they would vote for that is if the capital was moved to Phil, from Philadelphia to Washington, D.C. So that construction would have started during the Washington years, but it wouldn't finish until, uh, until, until Adams and Jefferson would be the first one to serve his entire term in, in the White House. So this is, your, this is your first presidential, this is your first presidential mansion right there. All right. All right. George, how many of you have ever heard the myth that George Washington skipped a silver dollar all the way across the Potomac River? I've never heard that one, but I was doing some research because I had a bunch of George Washington myths, but I wanted to make sure I had more. So um, I had never heard this one, but the Potomac River is over a mile wide at Mount Vernon. So there is no way that George Washington could have flung a silver dollar that far. Um, in fact, there weren't any silver dollars according to Mount Vernon. Um, the first one was made in 1794. So uh, George Washington did not skip a silver dollar all the way across the Potomac, which I've never heard that myth. So that was a new one to me, but I figured if there was anybody that, would, that did, um, I would address that. All right. So one of the last Washington myths that I want to talk about, um, and maybe there are more depending on our timing, is George Washington's mom. George Washington's mom has gotten some scathing reviews uh, in recent history. In fact, I read an article in uh, Colonial Williamsburg's magazine's Trend, Trend and Tradition earlier in the year, or maybe it, was, maybe it was at the end of last year, about Washington's mom and about how she was totally cold, totally unloving, and they had a terrible relationship. Apparently she was the meanest mom ever to ever have lived, according to that. And according to other historians, Washington's and his mom were, did not have a good relationship and she was really, really mean to him. She criticized everything she did. A lot of times I think of, um, if you've ever seen Despicable Me and you've seen uh, Gru's mom, Gru builds this beautiful rocket ship and his mom looks at him and goes, eh. It's kind of how I think of Washington's mom because of the things that I've read about her. <coughs> Excuse me. But according to historian Alexis Coe, that's apparently not the case. Um, the, she, there is some writing from her that she missed a visit from Washington during the American Revolution. And she was absolutely devastated. Now, why would a woman who didn't like her kid be devastated about, about missing him during the American Revolution and knowing that like, she was so old that this was probably gonna be the last time she would ever see him. She wrote, I am afraid I shall never have that pleasure again about seeing him. And upon signing the letter, she wrote, loving and affectionate mother. So I, I don't think that a woman who didn't like her kid would, would quite go that far. However, she, Martha, or not Martha, excuse me, Washington's mom, Mary, Mary Washington, was kind of a dull lady. If, uh, if you read anything that she writes, um, she writes a lot about the Bible. She reads books about the Bible. Her voc she was literate, obviously, if she could write letters. But um, she didn't have a very big vocabulary and she didn't write with a flourish. So she was kind of a boring lady, but a boring lady doesn't necessarily 
translate into being a mean lady or a cold mom. So Washington, the, the relationship with Washington's mom, that those facts are kind of up in the air because you have, you have evidence that points either way. I'm just going to go take a quick look at the cookies and then we'll come back and we'll talk more. All right, everybody. First of all, they smell good. And second of all, they didn't melt into a paste today. So that's good. We're very happy with that. All right. So we talked about Washington and slavery. We talked about honesty. We talked about hemp, which was one of my favorites. Um, how about one last one before the cookies come out? And one last one is that it's about where George Washington is buried. George, there is a, uh, there, there is in fact a crypt beneath the United States Capitol and rumor has it that Washington is buried in that crypt. Washington is not buried in that crypt. Um, there have been calls for Washington's body to be moved to that crypt. Um, but in his will, besides only freeing a small group of people, in fact, only one person in his will was, was, uh, was freed outright, and that was his valet. Everybody else had to wait until Martha died, like I had said before, and Martha freed them almost immediately out of fear. Um, so George Washington, in his will, also said, I want to be buried at Mount Vernon. So if you go and visit Mount Vernon, uh, you can visit his final resting place. He is in a tomb overlooking the Potomac River at the estate. Um, but the crypt at the Capitol was intended to be his burial place. So when they built the, um, when they built the Capitol building, they had every intention of putting Washington's body in there, but Washington was like, I don't think so. In fact, Washington was like, I don't think so when he was called upon to be president too. So he had just finished the American Revolution. He won a very long war. He went back to Philadelphia again to write the US Constitution. He was the president of the Constitutional Convention, goes back to Mount Vernon, puts his feet up, grabs some George Washington whiskey. Whiskey is something that was made at Mount Vernon. It was Washington's favorite drink. And he gets a knock on the door. Hey, guess what? You just won the election. And going back to be president was more of an eye roll for George Washington than it was something that he was really excited about because he knew that he was gonna have to build this nation from the ground up. There were a lot of issues after the American Revolution. You include slavery as one of them. The nation was an incredible debt. The nation was um, at the brink of uh, of riot, and perhaps we could even call it civil war because uh, people were poor. Continental soldiers weren't being paid the money that they were promised. So things were quite a mess when George Washington becomes president, and he did have his work cut out for him. So. Um, his not being enthusiastic about becoming president of the United States is no surprise. The man just wanted to retire. All right, let's go get those cookies, maybe. Okay. All right, so your cookies should be a nice golden brown around the edges. Mine spread out a little bit to be biscuity looking, but they are not nearly what, they're not lacy. Your, teach, your, your, your cookies should not look lacy or greasy. If they're flat, lacy, and greasy, they're still going to taste delicious, but they're going to be ugly. If you want a cookie that is both delicious and not ugly, um, then hopefully it'll look a little bit about, a little bit what mine looks like too, like now. Uh, they do spread out a little bit, so don't be alarmed that your cookies got really big. Or your jumbles, excuse me. Okay. I think if you've been watching for couple of weeks you might be noticing a theme of color in my kitchen. All right so here are Martha Washington's jumbles. Um, let them cool off for at least a minute. You want them to be cool. They are going to be actually a little bit doughy which is the way I like them. If you don't want them to be doughy leave them in the um, leave them in the oven for another couple of minutes. You just have to be careful because as the sides start to brown 
that's when you know they're done. Once they start to brown, they'll brown very, very quickly, and I know you don't want a burnt cookie. Um, they smell really, really good. They smell, uh, they smell really good. Uh, thank you, Danny. They look way better than they looked yesterday. If you follow me on Instagram or on Facebook or even on Twitter, you would have seen the test kitchen version of these yesterday. That's how I know they taste really good. So next week for History in the Kitchen, we are going to be taking a look at um, and learning about Black Wall Street in the Greenwood section of Tulsa, Oklahoma in the 1910s and 20s. Um, I'm still looking for a recipe to go along with that. I spent the morning scouring some phone books to find directories of restaurants that existed on um, in that area of Oklahoma. Um, so rest, I will announce the recipe tomorrow, but if you're excited about learning about Black Wall Street, come on and tune in with, uh, to me next Friday at one o'clock, same, same time, same place. Um, if you would like to rewatch this video, you can rewatch it here on Facebook or you can follow me on YouTube at Teaching History Her Way. Uh, Instagram also Teaching History Her Way or Twitter History Her Way. You can also view my blog where I'll post all of the information from today plus today's recipe, teachinghistoryherway.com. Um, last week, by the way, thank you. I This program has been an awesome thing for me over the summer. I am really loving cooking and teaching every week. Um, last week, we got over a thousand views, which is totally awesome. I never expected for that many people to watch History in the Kitchen. So keep on the lookout on the Facebook page and the Instagram page for a giveaway. Williams Sonoma is one of my favorite places to get um, bakeware and kitchen towels. So um, I'm going to be doing a kitchen towel and or wooden spoon giveaway to help you with your baking endeavors during the week. And look out for my announcements for Black Wall Street History in the Kitchen edition for next week. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you so much for learning with me. If you have any questions, please make sure you ask. If you have any suggestions for next time, let me know. It was Danny's idea to do Washington this week, so thank you, Danny. And I will see you next Friday. Have a great week.